kind of father is the Lord? That would be interesting to do a survey on that. And many of you would answer based upon your own earthly experience with a father. For some Christians, God is a very hard tyrant. And they're always feeling like they've let him down. For other Christians, God is sort of a laissez-faire, let it be, Father. They can do whatever they want to do. It doesn't really matter. He could care less. And for other Christians, he's an up and down Father. But the Bible presents him as a great, glorious, holy, righteous Father who is so tender and merciful and kind and compassionate. He embodies strength and compassion in a way that we can only look at and marvel. And he is the tender shepherd of our soul. Let's stand for the word of God. Psalm 103, one of the greatest gifts I could give to you this morning. The word of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to, to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like the grass, and he flourishes like the flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. The word of the Lord. Please be seated and get your seatbelt on and let's prepare. Three uh, principles this morning. And uh, again, they are an outline that prepares us for a conversation with God. And yes, in the proclamation of the word, God is doing the talking. When we pray, uh, most of the time, uh, we're doing the talking. And, and uh, the Holy Spirit will, will convey impressions back. But we're doing the talking through the power of the Spirit. But when, when the sermon comes, God is doing the talking. And we are on the receiving end. First principle, um, remember who God is and who we are. Remembering who God is and who we are. And I'll explain that again. It's one of the most important principles of the Christian life. Two, remembering his gracious discipline. And I'll explain that as best as I can. And three, living now with one eye on eternity. All right. Remembering who God is and who we are. Tim Keller has said this is the essence of all of our sin and of our bad days. <laughs> That's all encompassing, isn't it? He says, every time we blow it, a big time, we've forgotten who God is. Every time we're overcome by depression and anxiety and despair, we've forgotten who God is. And every time we go into self-pity, we've forgotten who God is. Every time we say, my situation is hopeless, we've forgotten who God is. And every time we 
fail just to be consistent, we've forgotten who God is. But he's also said we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten who we are in Christ. Not just who we're going to be, but what does it mean to be heirs of Christ's kingdom, children of the king, those who have received the full kingdom of God. We have forgotten who we are as bold men and women who do have power over sin and the weakness of the flesh. We forget constantly who we are. That's why we mess up. Now, there's a very interesting thing here. Verse, uh, the first five verses here is the gospel in the Old Testament. And it's a, it's a very different emphasis. Most of the time, when the Bible focuses on our meditation, it is on the attributes of God, what I just did with you, who God is. What, just like when a man meets a woman that he loves and he's waited all his life to meet her, he can't stop describing her to friends. You'll have to meet her. You have to see what she's like. Oh, she is amazing. Now, we do that a hundred times more to God, all right? We focus on his attributes. How great thou art. One of the great uh, hymns of the church. But the psalmist takes us to a different place here. Where, where many times we're a little cautious to go. Instead of his attributes, he focuses on his what? It's in verse 2 if you'd put it up, Nathan. Forget not all his... Benefits, And that's a dangerous thing to preach to an American audience because the consumer church is always interested in what can you do for me, God? All right? But he's saying here is, apart from God, you have no life. Apart from God, you have no joy. You have no salvation. You have no future. You have no destiny. Everything you have, don't you realize what he's given you in the gospel? Forget not what all his benefits. And when, instead of that, we go to our broken cisterns because we assume that they provide better benefits. Sin will help me out more than God, all right? Or a bad place in my life will help me out more than God. We go to those same broken cisterns and drink from the same toxic water. So he says, forget not all his benefits. Verse 3 is what is called a Hebrew parallelism. Those are big words. It means it's saying the same things using different language. Now, Christians have said, aha, this means that God is bound to heal every disease in this life, and that's not what it's teaching. He's saying here, by the way, many times the Bible uses the expression of healing our diseases as an expression of healing our sin. I could point to many scriptures. He forgives all of our iniquity and heals all of our diseases. Well, you can see that many people have taken that to mean that God must heal in every situation. Okay, I'm just pointing that out. He's saying that he has dealt with your estrangement and your brokenness. He's brought you to himself and he redeems your life from the pit, which is what life is like without God. And he crowns you, that's what it means to be in Christ, with steadfast love. That's the Hebrew word hesed. C-H-E-S-E-D. I'm going to ask you that when I see you on the street someday. I don't want to meet you then. No, it's just that it's such an important term in the Bible. His covenant, he's married. That's a covenant of love. He's overflowing with love. And he satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Now, some of you are saying, wow, I want to get some of this. What's going on? I can be that satisfied in the living God so that I feel like I'm young again. And he renews me when everything's falling apart. Yeah, that's the promise of Scripture. And that's what God has for his people. So how do we honor God? That's the question. And it's uh, twofold, two sides of the same coin. In Psalm 103, the Bible is saying forget not, which is when the answer is we honor God by not forgetting. Or the flip side of that coin is what? We honor God by remembering. Now remember, I've, I've gone over this a bunch of times, but the, the biblical word remembering is very different from our word for remember. You know, you ask me about, the, oh yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember. The, the biblical word on the positive side is like the negative connotation of PTSD. What happens in PTSD? Particularly with soldiers in combat or rape victims. They remember in such a way that it's such traumatic it's like it's happening again. Waking up a soldier, what? Having incredible noises and, 
and explosions going on. It is so real that the conscience is experiencing it again. That's what the Bible means by remember. So it says, remember the Lord God in the days of your youth. It also remembers it when you get older too, but it's speaking especially to young people where there's so many temptations of the body. And, uh, and he's saying, don't forget for one second because your heart will easily. And that's why when we do the communion, we what? We remember the Lord Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we remember, we ask the Lord through his Holy Spirit to make it alive and to press our hearts on it. And so when something is remembered, it controls our consciousness. You know, I remember, oh wait, this stove has a problem. It's got one place that's hot over here, but it's been a lot of years I've forgotten. Ah! Oh! Ooh! Now, I remember. It causes me to change. I will never do that again. I remember, you say, how I hurt my spouse. And I remember the incredible tears that he or she cried. And I remember how I felt at that time. And I said, I will never do that again. But then six months went by. And I forgot the impact of my sin. So the human heart forgets God. And not so much, oh yeah, no, no, no. We forget in terms of trusting him, relying on him. It is so easy to forget. Our hearts are like Teflon. Here today and gone tomorrow. And the same thing is true with things people say to us. You know, I was telling someone, and I think it's probably a hundred to one, that um, we don't do this very well, husbands. I'll speak for myself. But it, a, a husband, for every critical word he gives his wife, I was told years ago, and I didn't remember that enough. I was told for every critical word you say to your wife, you must have at least 10 words of affirmation. And um, actually, it should be about 50, all right? Because if you correct your wife and don't affirm her, um, you'll find out what happens with that, all right? All right? And so you can say 50 tender, kind words to your wife and one harsh word, and guess which one she will remember. Yeah, you got it. Or with yourself. You may have parents that affirmed you, and parents, we need to consistently affirm who our children are in our discipline of them. And, uh, and yet, one time in a fit of rage when a parent says, you will never amount to anything. I am so sick of you. How many years do you think they will remember that? But I said a hundred things to them. Okay, you get it. That's the way it is with God's word. And so it's when it says, forget not his benefits. Here today and gone tomorrow, we forget when we're having a bad day, Tuesday, I don't even know what the sermon was. And you need to nurture yourself in the word of the Lord. Deuteronomy 8, 7 to 12, and I think someday I'd like to do some stuff from Deuteronomy. It's so powerful. But it talks about remembering God when things go well. The Israelites going into a good land and the danger of prosperity. This is really for America Deuteronomy 8, 7 and 12. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, Ooh. a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, that's America, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper, Ooh. And you, you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God. Right alongside that. By not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, you will forget the Lord your God. Amen. Isn't that for us today in America? Amen. You say, oh no, we haven't forgotten God. Really? And so the Lord says, worship and the word revives your memory because it's easily forgetting. And the heart, apart from the Holy Spirit, will never want to gaze into the greatness of God. The book of Romans says we suppress the truth 
in self-righteousness. And so the Lord is awakening us today. And he is saying to us, Jesus Christ was forgotten on the cross. Did you realize that? He was forgotten? C.S. Lewis says, by the way, the true essence of hell is being ignored. I thought that was fascinating. He says, fire and brimstone, their metaphor is fine, but that doesn't really hit home. He says, the worst thing a person can experience is to be ignored and to be ignored for all of eternity, to have conscious existence and to be ignored by God and the rest of the kingdom. That's hell, huh? Many people are experiencing that in Denver today. They feel ignored, they feel in hell. It has already begun. That's why the gospel is going forth. But Jesus Christ was forgotten for that time on the cross when the whole cosmos became dark for six hours so that you know you will never be forgotten, no matter how tough things get. And the truth of the scriptures will come alive as the Spirit applies it to you. I know I quote Tim Keller, and I do that on purpose. He has been my pastor, and I have been dead committed to making sure that I never plagiarize in this pulpit. So when I have a thought, I use the person's name versus having you think I'm so creative and such a great scholar. No, I think it's important. I think we, we credit people for their, their work. But, but, but um, Keller has used the example of the hairy tarantula to describe how we forget God. And he says that when, there has to be a process by which God takes the truth and moves it from head to heart and we come alive and say, oh my. He says, you're sitting there and I say to you, there is a mean, green, hairy, tarantula climbing up your arm. Did you know that? It's slowly moving. You say, yeah, tarantulas aren't good. Yeah, this is a good sermon. When it finished, we've got to go to lunch. Tarantulas are not good. There is a green, hairy, mean tarantula slowly climbing up your arm. It's going to go up to the shoulder and then maybe into your hair. Hmm. That is not good. We have got to have the city deal with tarantulas someday. And then he says, the person jumps up and says, oh, there's a green, hairy, mean tarantula climbing all over me. It's coming up my arm. It's going to be in my face and my hair. Oh my gosh. And it became alive to him. He says, that's what has to happen in worship. Where you say, the love of God, which is so costly, is more than just a nice thing. You know, Frank, if you tell a person that's depressed or struggling, or, you know how much God loves you? They go, oh yeah, yeah, we hear, hear that again, right? Yeah, God loves me. If you realize how much that love has cost, you jump out of that seat to think that I am that loved and cherished by the living God. What has happened, friends? The scripture has gone from my head to my heart and my soul has been revived. Amen? So that's what the men's retreat is going to be about, how to revive the soul by the word of God. That's the first principle. Until you die, I pray you remember we sin because we forget who God is and we Forget who we are. I told you that was going to be long, so don't panic, all right? Second principle. We remember his gracious discipline. Now, I know I could do a whole message on this. And I know you'll have questions on this. Well, is, is God upset with me? Is he putting me through a bad season? Be careful about those analogies. But the Bible stresses that the Lord disciplines those he loved because he cherishes us so much. Like a father disciplines his children, the father has pity, and but he disciplines those whom he loves. The Lord is merciful and gracious. That's his character. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Parents aren't always slow to anger. I know I wasn't and still not at times. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. Now, I know you're going to ask, well, how does that express? Is he going to turn off the blessings against me? Is he going to turn my furniture into driftwood or... No, no, that's not biblical discipline. And the Bible gives us a picture of what biblical discipline looks like. He does not deal with us according to our sins, thank God, nor repay us according to our iniquities. You spend three weeks grounded because you've done that. No, 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 that's not what it says. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That's the gospel right there. And as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion 
toward those who fear him. I know many people in Denver don't want to have a father because you know they have grown up, and many of you may have too, um, with a very imperfect father. One of the greatest issues of healing in my own life has been, and, it, and God has done a great work, even in my, my dad and I's relationship before he died, it was just the miraculous working of God of uh, bringing healing to a very damaged relationship. And uh, even it affected my calling God Father because I had so much anger toward my earthly father. And, and over the period of time, the Holy Spirit brings healing. Healing at the table, healing from the word. And he deals with the things that have happened to us. And I can't wait to see my father in heaven. I cannot wait to see him again. And I love him dearly. But that's the grace of God. That is the grace of God. But many people say, ah, I've never had a father. Or if I did, I had a sperm donor. But a father that treated me like this, I would only dream about. But, and I don't know if I can trust God as a father. Well, the Bible says he is the most amazing father that you've always yearned for. And he will discipline you because he loves you. Now, be, as soon as I say that, people will say, well, I guess he's giving me eight weeks of a bad fall. No, 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 no. He's going to cause me to lose my job. The, that's, that's human uh, discipline. He doesn't repay us. But he cherishes us so much that he will not allow us to run from him forever or remain in rebellion because he cherishes us so much. He is so jealous for us because of the incredible price paid for us by his son, Jesus Christ. So let me ask you the question. Do you perceive of God as a boss or as a father? Because many Christians I meet perceive of him as a boss. You know, if I keep this up, I'm going to get fired. If I keep it up, I'm going to lose wages. I, I, he's not going to, oh, man, I'm on very tenuous ground here. I've been struggling with depression. I feel even bad about that right now. Or is he a tender, compassionate father who loves you with the same love he has for his son? And the Bible says, well, what does it look like? Well, it's as high as the heavens are from the earth, and it says, why does the east is that east? Okay, east is from the, the west. The mountains are over there. It's that much that you can only use a metaphor to describe it. And he loves you with an incredible, steadfast love that a husband and wife could only dream about in the context of marriage. You know what someone said? That if you understand that, you can live in confidence when bad things are happening. Isn't that beautiful? You can live in confidence when bad things are happening. I told you I, I, when I was a young pastor, and I still like to think of myself that way, but there is a thing called denial. And, and uh, um, someone made me a cross stitch. I've said this about 40 times, so if you've been here a while, it's okay. It was one of my very first sermons, and she liked it so much, she cross stitched it for me. And, uh, but it, what it did, it cross-stitched it into my heart. And not just in, I don't know if I have the frame anymore, but she, it was, are you willing to live for a while without questions, knowing God never makes mistakes? That's what I said in the sermon, and she thought that was so powerful, she did a cross-stitch of it. Well, now, and that's part of me now. Now, do I remember that every day? No, no, I have a short memory when it comes to God. But I remembered it again today. Are you willing to live for a while without rebellion, without questions, without bitterness, knowing your heavenly Father will always, always do right by his children, remembering his gracious discipline? I've quoted John Newton many times, the slave trader and the pastor, both in the same life, who wrote what hymn, by the way? There you go. Good job. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a nice Denver person like me. No wretch. Newton said, everything is necessary that God sends into our life. Mm. And he says, nothing can be necessary that he withholds in our life. And we say, wait a minute. I need this more than John Newton would ever know. But nothing 
he withholds is absolutely necessary. But God, but God, huh? Everything he sends into our life is necessary. Why? Why? That's good that you asked that. Because he is so working in our lives that he's transforming us from a rebellious sinner into the very image of Christ. And it takes time. And it's painful. All right. This father knows what he's doing. And when you come to that conviction, your heart will be at rest. And he has compassion on his children. And by the way, if you want to describe Jesus' ministry to people, it was with the word compassion. This is the Hebrew equivalent of it. It's a gut-level, deep connection. You know how parents are always connected to their children? At least good parents. Even when they get old, we still like to rock them in the rocking chair. We don't do that because they're in their 20s and 30s or 40s or 50s. That would look odd. But, but seriously, one of my greatest moments of life was rocking my children um, you know, and uh, rocking them to sleep. I didn't even care if it was two in the morning most of the time. But why? Because a parent has compassion on a child. Um, there's a connectedness from a father and mother to a child. That's why God is connected to you, but multiply it by a million and times another million. And the compassion. And parents, when, they're in the, when my mother was on the second floor in the nursing home, so many of them would say, I just wish, I just wish, I just wish that my kids would come and visit more. And they're in their 80s and 90s, and they're still connected. There's still a, a whole light that goes on in their countenance when the children walk down the hall. It, it's just the way we're wired and made. And, and uh, the, that's the very analogy the Bible gives for God's connectedness to you. He has compassion on you. And he's your father. And he loves you. He remembers our frame. He knows that we are what? Dust. All right, we won't build on that. But you know, like holding a little infant. May, we, this, may this place be filled with crying babies. You say, I don't know if I want. Yeah, that's cool. We have a few of them at the second service now. And you look at them and you realize how helpless they are. And the parent knows that. You just can't leave them here and go shopping and see what happens. You know, and the Lord remembers how helpless we are. Now, you're not going to remain as dust because of Jesus, okay? But his compassion is like a parent to an infant and his care and concern for everything that happens to you. All right, time to move on. Living now with one eye on eternity. And the Bible is saying, wake up, wake up, wake up. You're only here for such a short time. You're kidding yourself. Look at this, verse 15. As for man, his days are like the grass. He flourishes like the flower of the field. For the wind passes over and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But here's the but. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. That's for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. To those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. And the Lord has established his throne in, heavens, in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Now, he's doing deliberately providing a contrast here between those who are outside of his grace you could call them the wicked, but think they don't have to remain the wicked. Why? Because the gospel's going forth to rebellious people like us and giving them the benefits of Christ. But it's given a picture here in the long term of those who are outside of his covenantal grace. In other words, we, not everybody can call God Father. I know that's politically incorrect, theologically incorrect. God is the creator of all mankind, but you become his child when you respond to his offer of salvation and you enter into a covenant relationship and you are what? Adopted. You take on his name. You have the legal rights of his family. That's what it means to be a child of God. And so the, the psalmist is giving a contrast between those who will die, they will perish, and those who what? Will live from everlasting to everlasting. And so your life is going to be a long time. God did not create you for the grave. He created you for life in his presence and we just completely forget that our life on earth is like a little blip compared to the days of eternity. 
And it even gives us a picture right now that the Lord is in his heaven. As many people say, well, what's he doing? He's allowing all these crazy ISIS terrorists and others and all this wicked stuff. He's ruling his kingdom from the heavens. And by the way, Christ is at his right hand interceding as the Holy Spirit brings about the kingdom of God on earth. But, 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 one day his throne in the heavens will what? Come down to earth. Earth will go up to heaven. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and his throne will be before us, and all the wicked will be dealt with. And so the Bible is just saying, wake up, wake up, wake up on this Labor Day weekend. Make your days count. If you've never responded to him as Father, you do so by honoring his Son, by receiving him as Lord and Savior. You come to know God as Father through his Son, Jesus. And you make your days count. You get to know him now before the day of trouble comes. What's the day of trouble? Well, it could be many things, but it means basically my mortal body is falling apart and I really can't remember anything and I just, it's, it's a troubling time. I've got medical bills and I don't know, I, who hasn't ever raised the question, well, I, mean, I guess some do. Am I gonna have enough money before I die to take care of this body? You don't think, I don't think that because my mother lived in 98. I thought she was going to live to 198. And so the day of trouble is when I can't articulately speak to you anymore and I'm stumbling and I'm drooling and those are hard days and my mom knew those days and I honor her for her perseverance. And there was a time that I couldn't even read scripture to her because she couldn't comprehend more than one sentence. But I did read scripture to her while she could. And that's just saying, get to know the Lord now as you are doing. Because the days on earth are very short. And stop kidding yourself that you're going to be here forever. Seize the moment, seize the gospel and sees the love of the Father. For he's great and powerful and righteous and holy. But he's the most tender father you could ever imagine. So much so that I want to call him daddy and jump into his arms. Amen? Let's fall before him by, your gra- by his grace. Lord, as we approach the table now and... Uh, We are reminded of the means of grace. Uh, Lord, we're so forgetful. We choose broken cisterns over living water. And we do so because we're deluded. And yet, you love us as a father loves his children. And you prepare our hearts continually. You soften our hearts so that we would learn of you. Take us by the hand. Lead us out, Lord God. If we're trusting in our own self-righteousness, we're in danger of perishing. And Father, lead us to the Savior. And if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, remember you come to know the Father through the Son. Say, Lord Jesus, I want you. I I want to know you. I want to know this love. I want to know this grace. I want to know this forgiveness. I want to know it now while I can comprehend it. I receive you in your finished work on the cross and in doing so I receive the very life of God through the Holy Spirit in my soul and I invite you to fill me with the very life of God and if you've prayed that prayer you have become a Christian, a Christian as Luther called a little Christ. Please let someone know. Please let someone know. Let me know. And Father, for those of us who name the name of Christ, we have been adopted. We are your children. We have all the legal rights of the family. We are rich in Christ. Father, help us to awaken to who you are and who we are. And we pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.